Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Canopus Chats with J.D. Price. I would like to say thank you so much for the support you've offered, for liking, for subscribing, commenting, and to sharing what it is that you've learned from my channel. I am looking forward to providing you with more content that will inspire you to do more today. All right. So here we are today. I have an awesome guest in my presence and I'd love to introduce her to you. So my guest holds a master's of science in systems engineering management and is a program manager at one of the leading telecommunications provider nationally. She is responsible for reducing cost and increasing revenues. Can we say it? Ching, ching, ching. So she's saving money and she's also bringing in money. That's awesome. Please help me welcome Crystal Williams Stewart to Canopus Chats. Welcome, Crystal. How Hello. Are you? Hi, Janet. How are you doing? Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. No problem. Awesome. I was looking forward to it. Lovely. So, as I've told you before, uh, we're in season two, and season two is all about choices. And our guests talk about the choices they have made that has helped them to be where they are, establish themselves where they are today. So to get started, I have here three cards and you are going Ooh. to share your I am statement with us based on which of the cards you choose. So go ahead and tell me which number. I will go with number one. Number one, all right. So number one says, I am a strategic leader. Can you talk to me about you being a strategic leader? What does that mean? Oh, okay. Great question. Let's see. Uh -huh. um, so when I, when I think of the word strategy in general, I usually think it in terms of where do you want to be long term? So when I kind of apply that thought to leadership, it's really around where do I want to be? What are my goals long term? And how do I take my team there? So a couple of elements come to mind when I think about strategic leadership. Mm -hmm. I would say, number one, making the goal or objective very, very clear to the team. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, probably one of the most important things you can do when you have people under you. Okay. The second part is understanding what makes your team tick. Mm -hmm. um, how do they engage? What gets them going? Some people, it's about the money that you're paying them, and that's good enough. Some of Some are about... Um, verbal af affirmation, some about achieving the goal. So it's really understanding my team, understanding what makes them tick, making sure that the goal is very crisp and clear to them, and setting short-term and long-term goals and kind of cheering them along and praising them throughout the wins and the losses. Right. Um, we celebrate the wins. We also celebrate the losses because those are opportunities to learn and pivot quickly. So that's what I when I think about strategic leadership. Those are kind of some of the elements that like pop out to me. Awesome. So definitely you're def you people person oriented because all of those skills you have described has to do with communication and you knowing the people whom you work with. So that is awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. All right. Well, it's my turn. I get to ask you some questions based on our previous conversation. So let's get started. So bring me back. We know where you are right now, but take me mm -hmm. to your childhood. How would you describe your childhood and the path it has created for you to pursue your career in engineering? Sure. Um, as a child, um, anyone knows me is no surprise. I'm, I'm an introvert, so I, I often kept to myself, very quiet, um, mild-tempered, um, but I always loved to read and study. Um, and throughout my academics, naturally, the literature came easy to me, grammar, you know, the, the less technical uh, pieces of the academics. Mm -hmm. But when it came to math and science, those are things that my mom kind of pushed me to engage in because it wasn't my natural strength. It was something that I actually had to, to work for. So I think with that, it almost kind of like it, it grew on me. The math and the sciences grew on me and it became something that because my parents pushed me to get involved in STEM from a very early age, mm -hmm. it's something that I, I've grown to kind of change my paradigm around in terms of 
it's okay if you're not naturally good at something. Mm -hmm. It's if you work hard and stay committed, mm -hmm. you can become good. So that's kind of the transition to where I was as a child in terms of what I was naturally attracted to or, or my affinity naturally went to other subjects, mm -hmm. but I was kind of groomed over time to kind of really focus on kind of my area of weakness and really like lean in and, and develop those areas. So let's see. We've heard that to be an engineer, you have to be gifted almost in <laughs> this uh, science and math. And you're telling me that your affinity or your interest was English history on that side. Was there a time where you felt like, oh my God, I can't do this? It, it's, you know, it's easy to fall back on what you know or you're accustomed to versus mm -hmm. pushing yourself to learn more about the part that you're a little reticent about. So um, it, it's, at the time, clearly I didn't know what my parents um, <laughs> was doing when they were pushing me. Naturally, when you see a child that... Um, have strength in certain areas, you kind of um, push them to, to pursue it and grow. But I think what my mom specifically realized in me was because I'm naturally an introvert, if I didn't naturally get it right the first time, I would retreat and go to my safe space or something else. And what she was actually doing is teaching, like building res resilience in me that it's okay that you didn't, you don't get this naturally at first, keep on trying and keep on trying. And as I grew up and, and committed to studying and learning something that I wasn't naturally good at, the success that I saw along the way kind of pushed me to want to do more and more and more and develop in those areas. And my mom would always tell me, if you can get an A, in all these subjects, there's no reason why you should have a B <laughs> in this one. So that was kind of like the mindset that I went into it. And I, I, I actually started loving it because math is black and white. You don't, it's either right or wrong. And I, <laughs> and I, I see a lot of the world like that. It's, it's, it's right and wrong areas. And I think with math, it's something, math and science, something that if you understand the discipline and you train yourself and, and, and build on the basic skills, mm -hmm. it's either right or wrong. <laughs> okay. So you, you were resilient and you were tenacious about it and eventually you fell in love. That's mm -hmm. awesome. So here you are working in the industry. What kind of academic preparation did you go through to be at this stage in your life? So let's talk about undergraduate, and I know that you also have a graduate degree, so let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. So um, undergraduate, I, I studied mechanical engineering, and um, to no surprise, tons of math. Tons and tons <laughs> and tons of math. Um, there, there you, calc, you go up to Calc 4, and then after Calc 4, like, there's just, um, you, you would have to learn quantum, quantum physics. There's a lot of science involved. And one thing I would say, even though I look back and it's, it's kind of intimidating, a lot of these subjects are um, uh, buildable subjects. So if you get the foundation and the core yeah. of it, it's really like additive and applying concepts on top of it. So I did a lot of that in my undergrad, the physics, the sciences, the um, statics and dynamics courses. Um, and then I started working in the field a little bit, the engineering field where um, my first job out of undergrad was um, doing designing. Nice. And in my mind, I thought, I'm like, oh, wow, I, you know, I'm going to be an engineer and the word is so great. I'm going to go into the field. <laughs> And then I went into the field and I, I hated it. <laughs> I, it was just, it, it didn't tap into that other side of me that I enjoyed, like, you know, working in an office and like strategy. It didn't, it didn't allow me to do those types of things. So when I thought about, okay, well, where do I want to go from here? I was, I realized that in order for me to kind of excel in my career, mm -hmm. but kind of keep the element of engineering that I loved, I would have to go into management. So that's when I decided to kind of pursue the track of um, engineering management with systems engineering, mm -hmm. because it, it built on the foundation of the engineering, but now they're applying management practices where you have more of the soft skills and dealing with people, which I realized that if I wanted to excel and become a leader in the, the, the tech or engineering space, mm 
Mm -hmm. um, I would have to have either an MBA or um, a master's degree in management. I see. Okay. So you didn't quit when you found out that, the, you know, being more hands-on in the field was not really your forte. You just strategized, recalibrated, and found an area that matched your expertise and your interests. I love that. Uh, sometimes people quit too mm -hmm. soon, but you just strategize and re, uh, reassess to find out what's good for you. I love that. Excellent. Now, Right now, you're operating as a process manager. You talk about uh, mitigating costs and you know increasing revenues. But prior to that, you were a consultant. What was your experience like as a consultant, and what did that look like for you in terms of that model, that business model? Okay, so um, when when people hear the word consultant, they think of oh wow, you're an expert in everything, and then really <laughs> nothing at all. <laughs> but um. In the simplest form, um, consultants are just basically problem solving. And once again, I, I kind of go back to that buildable skill. Um, when you actually get hired out of school as an engineer, very rarely are you hired for a particular engineering practice, unless you're specifically going into mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. You're really a lot of times hired for your ability to critical think. So when I went into the consultant space, it was kind of a, a transition from the hardcore engineering environment where prior to I was on a, um, on a shop floor, you know, working the line, more into the field of, okay, now you, a company or organization has this problem. Apply the same set of critical thinking skills you would to a design concept right. to helping the organization, organ, organization, sorry, fix this problem so um and it really stretches across the broad of, across the board to any conflict or problem you can think of within an organization whether they're p l they need to improve their p l whether they have productivity or um oh, wait a minute it's p l tell, tell, tell <laughs> us what p l is because of technical terms <laughs> oh sorry sorry um profit and loss right okay thank so, you <laughs> yes <laughs> so whether they want to improve that like balance that or they want to make their processes more efficient or just overall improve their their operating um expense mm -hmm. That's something you would usually call a consultant in and say, hey, take a look at my operation. And from an outside in point of view, which is really kind of the element that a, the consultant brings, mm -hmm. tell me how I can improve it based on something, some basic principles you understand about process engineering mm -hmm. and um, organizational structure and things of that nature. So that's really what I did as a consultant. And even today, I'm an internal consultant for a telecommunications company. Mm -hmm. And it's it's doing the same exact things. How do I help the organization um, increase their profit, <laughs> reduce their loss um, by making their processes more efficient? Awesome. So that is really the, the work side. Did your work take you outside of the country? Were you always in the United States as a consultant? <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear more. Tell me a little bit more about sure, if you travel. Sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so prior to, you know, marriage, kids, the whole thing, um, mm -hmm. I always I always loved traveling. I always wanted to travel the world. So um, I worked with a, a, a large um, manufacturing organization, Rolls-Royce. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that <laughs> on you. You can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I worked for that company and actually had a, a really great opportunity to um, work as a um, engineering consultant in various um, locations around the world. So I was in Virginia, I was in, Ohio, I lived in Ohio, I lived in um, uh, England, I worked a little bit in Singapore. So um, I really had the opportunity to kind of take this skill as a, a consultant and um, help them improve their various sites. Um, and it ranged from anything to how do we get um, this unit off the line faster right. to how do we increase the productivity of our workers on the floor. So it ran the gamut of many th various things, but um, one thing that I did get out of the traveling aspect and, and being able to see um, different parts of the world right. is um, 
we're used to operating in America under, mm -hmm. you know, social norms that, you know, we were born and raised in. Um, one of the things about working in different countries is you have to change your communication tactics. Mm -hmm. um, you have to learn the norms of the country. And um, I'm a straight shooter. I'm the kind of person that's like, look, I need X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. You know, when can you get it to me? I really had to um, learn how to fine tune that approach um, and, and really meet people where they are and, and how they culturally understood um, working. Um, in various environments. So it was you know, fun. I enjoyed it's it. Interesting because you brought that up, and that was another question I had for you because, you know, we talk about operating in different cultural and uh, different cultures and our intercultural skills and being competent to function in different settings. So you just really segue into that. Uh, did you? I know you. So you talked about you being adaptable and also learning how to manage your style to or to adapt it to the setting that you were in. Was there ever a time when it was really challenging for you? <laughs> or <laughs> yes. Um. And and I, I I will be very transparent because I I, I appreciate this platform mm -hmm. because I think a lot of the things that not just I went through. I'm pretty sure that um a lot of people that look like me, especially in my field have um, similar experiences. So one of the things that I've dealt with out of the gate was I am a black female in an in this engineering discipline. So not a lot of people look like me. Like I was usually the only raisin in the rice when I walked into <laughs> a room. And you know, <laughs> you don't think that takes a, a toll on you until it does. Um, you're it was really an internal battle with myself of man i'm i'm constantly having to prove myself over and over and over and i try not to associate with the fact that oh it's because i'm a black woman but after a while it became very apparent that that was the only difference mm -hmm. um when you're sitting at, at the table um next to someone and you're voicing our opinions or you're 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 making statements that are constantly overlooked and 30 seconds later mm -hmm. your counterpart who the white male says the same exact thing and it gets acknowledged it takes a toll on you after a while so i think my learning through that has yes it's built my re re resilience, but it also taught me how to um, pivot, how to win the mental game because the past and, you know, you look at your academic records, like you can do this, Crystal, like, you know, you, you, you can achieve, your mom made you go back to the teacher <laughs> and change the B. So you, you can do those things, but it's a different game. That mental game, it's, it's, it's different when you're working in those type of environments. And I think my proudest moment is how I've developed through that mm -hmm. and come to realize that it's a different game. It's not just about showing up and doing the work. Mm -hmm. You really have to get over that, that, that mental psyche mm -hmm. of being other mm -hmm. and showing up and being your authentic self anyways. I really enjoyed uh, talking with you today, just learning a little bit about what it is that you're doing in your space, in your field, and the phenomenal lessons that you have learned along the way. As we wrap up our segment today, do you have a favorite quote, a story, or a phrase that you live by? And if so, what is it? Oh, let's see. Um... Oh, I have a couple. Um, oh man, let me see my favorite phase. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I there's a phrase that always uh, sticks out to me, and um, it's it's beauty is skin deep, dumbest to the bone, and um, it really <laughs> just talks about like. You can have a beauty, beautiful exterior, but if your inside is not good, it rots at your core. So that's just a fun phrase that I that I always think about when when I portray myself. It's not just looking nice on the inside, but it's always aligning my core, my inside to that external look as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now I have to throw one in just because you said it. Now you mentioned that you're an introvert and usually, you know, Susan B. Cain talked about uh, the power of introvert in a world that cannot stop mm -hmm. talking. 
as an introvert, they tend to be prefer to work alone, but you've talked about working with people <laughs> and managing relationships. How do you reconcile the two? <laughs> oh, that's an excellent question because it's been a journey. Mm -hmm. um, I <laughs> Naturally, I've only wanted to work by myself. Tell me what I need to do. I'll go off and get it done mm -hmm. by myself. But um, of course, as you go up the ladder, um, you can't be, unless you want to be a specialist, like it's not really possible to go up the ladder without you expanding your network and engaging with people. So I took tons of Meyer Briggs, tons of disc analysis, and constantly it, it told me, oh, you're the introvert, you like working by yourself. And I think once I realized, like, okay, Crystal, clearly just like back in the day, you understood that math and science wasn't your strong suit, but you needed to focus on that area anyway to grow. I realized that um, in my career, I couldn't continue being comfortable in my extroverted bubble if I wanted to grow. So some of the personalities I saw, I don't know if you've ever done the bird analysis, <laughs> where, you know, I am the owl, I am detailed, I like working with myself. Um, I realized that if I wanted to go into management, I would have to assume some of the lion and the peacock personalities, which meant I would have to speak up more. I would have to take lead and ownership. And I think there's various ways to do that. I'll never be the loud one in front of a, a um, classroom or boardroom screaming, look at me. Um, I'm usually a one-on-one -on -one lead from behind, bring people with me. So. The most effective method I have of engaging as an introvert is building one-on-one -on -one relationships um, and having an, an expand through there. Picking kind of the person with the most influence mm -hmm. and really building an authentic relationship with them mm -hmm. and, and having my influence go grow through that route. So that's kind of how I reconcile the two. Look at you. Look at you. <laughs> that is awesome, Crystal. Thank you so much for sharing with me today at Canopus Chat about your experience as an engineer and what that looked like as you grew and took on different leadership responsibilities. I hope that anyone who's listening today is really touched and inspired by you sharing your story. Again, thank you so much for joining me and I'm looking forward to speaking with you again soon. All right, enjoy yourself. Thank you so much for having me. You are absolutely welcome.